All right. So happy Fat Liberation Month, everyone. It's an exciting time here at NAFA. And welcome to Ahead of the Curve. So I'm Marcy Cruz. I am the Director of Fashion Industry Relations at NAFA. And my guest today, I'm really excited to introduce plus size fashion icon Velvet Diamore. Um, Velvet has changed my life. And to sum it up, you know, 2006, I was in my cubicle at work and I was going through a, um, the pages of In Touch magazine and I saw a picture of Velvet and I was like, who is this woman? And of course, the headline was 300 pound model walks the runway at Fashion <laughs> Paris Fashion Week. And I hate when they do that. They just put your weight out there, which is crazy. But anyway, um, and I see this beautiful woman walking the runway my size. And I thought, wow, I'm seeing myself like it, it. And it resonated with me so greatly because back then the models that we would see were like a size 12 and under. Right. Yeah. Totally. And so seeing velvet on the runway, I was like, yes. So you changed my life, oh, you know, you. from that moment on. And I'm just happy that you're here with us today. And so I want to just say before, you know, we get into our chat, yeah. um, let me share a bit with all of you about our work at the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Um, for those of you who are new to NAFA, we've been working hard to make the world a better place for fat people since 1969, which is incredible. And we do that work through education, advocacy, and support. And you can learn more about what we do at our website, which is naafa.org, or by following us on your favorite social media channels at NAFA Official. We are spending the entire month of August, as I just mentioned in the beginning, by continuing fat community through virtual events to celebrate Fat Liberation Month, social media posts, and more. You can find all of our events on our website at nafa.org. You can also see how others are celebrating by checking out the hashtag Fat Liberation Month. You can also find information on our site about the campaign for size freedom, which supports laws to protect people from size discrimination. Please stop by our site. It's so important. Please sign the petition today. It, it would really make an impact and mean a lot. I'd also like to introduce our interpreters from Pro Bono ASL, Flo and Ingrid. To learn more about the important accessibility work that Pro Bono ASL does, please find them on your favorite social media channels or visit their website at probonoasl.com. Now, without further ado, let's meet Velvet. Uh, I just wanna say thank you for coming, Velvet. Let me just do like a quick little bio about you. Um, yeah. You are American born, but mm -hmm. now you're Paris based. I'm jealous. Yes. Oh, you, are, thank you. you started out as a plus size model. Then you became a photographer. I like to call you an artist because everything you do is a work of art. Oh, and you. you were just known internationally. I mean, you were on TV. You were in a few movies. I heard you were on a, on a French reality TV show. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. And you also founded Volup2 Magazine, which is amazing too, because I feel like the basis of your work is all about celebrating all bodies. You managed yeah. to show the beauty in all bodies. And that's mm -hmm. something that I think has made an impact, um, not just in our community, but in the world, mm -hmm. you know, I truly believe that. So. Thank you. The first question, of course, is something that I just talked about. You know, when you walked the runway at Paris Fashion Week, I mean, the year was 2006. And as I have mentioned, a lot of the models we saw in the media, we see mm -hmm. on the retailers' websites, they were like a size 12 and under. I mean, they were getting pinned. Yeah. As you know, I worked for the company. There were girls, I, unfortunately, who were dying on the runway, too, at that point. Yes. Two yes. Brazilian sisters who died, actually. On the wow. runway. Yeah, very, wow. very sad. Well, first thing I'd like to say, uh, my, my name is Velvet Damour, and um, I wanted to thank NAFA, actually, before we get into the questions, just because, you know, when I 
began my own personal fat liberation maybe 35 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, I was looking desperately for like images of fat people that were positive. And I remember finding a magazine called Radiance. I don't know if you'll remember it. It was kind of a feminist or yes. whatever. And then there yes. was Dimensions, which was more like FA, but it was like the only things mm-hmm. I could find in NAFA. And then Marilyn um, Juan, amazing Marilyn Juan, came out with Fat So, which was super yes. revolutionary. Yes. But um, yeah, NAFA, I think, is such an incredible organization. And, you know, there's been so many people who, unfortunately, we've lost and those who are still around who I just, I really want to honor and and just appreciate because, you know, we're in a really different era now. And I think as hard as it can be for us now, if you can imagine back in the day when it all began, like it, it was much more challenging, I'd imagine. And so it's just such an important organization. And I feel super honored to be here through NAFA and obviously with you who you know, are a legend in your own right and how you're really advocating you. for women who are supersized. And and especially within fashion. And I think that's like a niche. Not a lot of people, you know, do that. So congratulations. And I appreciate you for that. And thank you, thank NASA, you. too. So thank for me, you. I actually was probably an artist first before I was a model. I kind of fell into modeling. I was always one of those people who, even when I was younger, I mean, I was not that fat. I was, um, you know, I was actually, I was, I was like conceived of as fat, but like, I guess to the point where I was bullied for being fat. Right. And so my mom Mm -hmm. signed me up for this swim team so that I was like fat in a swimsuit, (laughs) but then that got me like having to do sports and be, you know, shot put and discus, not like the cheerleader cutie stuff, but sort of, you know, the big bulky chick stuff. But I mean, I was probably, you know, 140 pounds and I was five feet seven and people would always be like, are you a model? Are you a model? Are you a model? And that's kind of began the whole yo-yo dieting and getting fat phase of life. And um, so I didn't really ever get to model until I had sort of given that up in a sense, because I was always conceived of as too fat. So back in like 85, 86, uh, you know, it was actually IMG models who were interested in me and they were like, oh, you have the face of talent. And I was like, the face of talent, Hmm, interesting way to put that. And um, and so I went on this massive diet of 500 calories. And as we've all, you know, unfortunately, lots of people have gone through, but it was a really anorexic cocaine type time in life. And so I lost down to 117 pounds, which, you know, I don't really talk. I mean, I, I'm saying all this kind of number bullshit because I want to set the precedent for the standards of beauty that were at that time and why I did not get to be a model at the time that I had foreseen pursuing it because of the fact that at 117 pounds, they were like, you are too fat. <laughs> I was like, fuck this. And so there was just no way humanly possible. And I think that that kind of got me into my own personal revolution because I was so rejected by not being able to be like, to come that close to being a model and then not have it happen. And so it was really disappointing. And then it started all the yo-yo dieting and the obsession with like, you know, starving and drinking gallons of water and all that other. And then obviously getting fatter and fatter. And then getting to a point where it was like, I read Fat as a Feminist Issue, which was another revolutionary book for me. And I had a therapist who had done stuff with that Fat as a Feminist Issue. And so it was when I started looking into like, you know, how fat people are seen, where can I see images of fatness? And that is what I think you probably get asked this question a lot. I get asked this question a lot about confidence and how you accept yourself and like, how can yes. you be so confident? <laughs> and that's really mm-hmm. where what I think is the key to confidence is, is that it's such a personal journey to accept yourself. And so I began looking for images of fatness, didn't really find them. And that's why I created them. So my modeling was really art. It wasn't really me like getting in front of a camera, getting paid to model. It was me deciding that because there were no images of anyone as fat as myself within the fashion realm, I was going to make them. And it was kind of a personal, like, fuck you to the fashion industry, because it was like, Mm -hmm. you get here, you hear all the time, like such a pretty face, such a pretty face. 
And after a while, it just is irritating as fuck. So forgive my language, sorry. <laughs> but it is really that level of irritation. So I had my friends take pictures of me, which I would emulate um, it with my own self, right? And so my book was very different because it was not created from someone, you know, creating, being paid to shoot necessarily. It would be like me with a wet t-shirt in Turks and Caicos with I love me on it. Right. And, and mm-hmm. I'm like, three, or I'm in a string bikini. Now there were women modeling, you know, but it was like, they were perceived as being relegated to fetishism. So yes. it was very, then that's kind of like any, but any image you have, you could take, and that's what kind of pissed me off. You could take some chick in Vogue who might have like a see-through top on and like makeup and be looking in the distance. And that's fashion. You do the exact same thing with a woman my size and it's automatically pornography or fetishist, you know, content. And why? Like, that's the question I I began asking, you know, why we're just completely left out of fashion. So, so I began as an artist and then I'd always been a photographer from the time I was like 18 years old. And I got more into photography when I lived in Italy. And uh, that, then what happened is I gave up the whole modeling thing. I moved to France and I have always shot people, you know, when it came to like, when I was in New York, I was shooting models from all the model agencies, right? Testing models, it's called. So -hmm. when I found that France opened its first plus size agency, I wanted to support it because I knew having been an agent for hair and makeup artists and photographers that people didn't want to touch the plus size girls. You know, there'd be a job that would come in and it would be Macy's plus size and everyone would be like, oh, don't give it to me, you know? So I knew that that was really something that people avoided. So I went to the agency, I sent some pictures because I'm also obviously a female photographer and um, she, her. And so I, you know, said, Hey, like I'm here, I'm, I'm psyched to shoot you guys if you want. And, and I sent a picture of myself showing that I was, you know, a plus size woman as well, just because there are so many male photographers, et cetera. And they said, well, could you come into the agency? And then I went into the agency and I'm 39 years old and I'm 300 pounds. And the last thing I'm expecting in life is to get signed as a model. And they said, you know, we want you to model for us. And I was like, huh? <laughs> so I wasn't like going to pursue modeling. It was that this agency created Wanted, which was an agency kind of like Ugly in, in London, which is another agency that takes the extraordinary, the weird. It's called or norm in French. So like out of the norm or the perceived norms. So um, that was how the modeling thing came about. And actually before modeling for Jean-Paul Gaultier, the kind of big deal that I had was actually modeling for John Galliano because he created the first runway show that I was in, which was his, you know, personal clothing. And it was um, Everybody's Beautiful. And that was kind of a precursor to the same flavor that's in Volup 2 because it had small people, it had old people. Um, It didn't have differently able people as I recall, but like a basketball player with a small person. And, and it was, you know, quite revolutionary what he did previous to Jean-Paul Gaultier. Jean-Paul Gaultier was actually having, um, he was hearkening back to um, a previous show where he had used a plus size woman. And so I went to all the castings for that and got closer and closer. And it really was based on my book that I got in because the images were so extraordinarily different. And look what happened. You see, it's like it came full circle for you. Yeah, that's I mean, what I, just, that's exactly what I, story so and I look at. I almost get teary eyed because it's so true that like, look what happened to me when I saw your picture. You Aww, know, thank you. That made me feel, you know, I was already confident in a sense, but mm-hmm. like my mirror image in a sense. I think it's so important in modeling in photography that Mm -hmm. everyone gets to see a reflection of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so rare in fashion that we have that. And I mean, they basically took a risk on me and, you know, I automatically became sort of validated within the fashion industry based on the names that were behind me. So, you know, if I, let's say pretend you had a fashion show and the exact same thing happened. You're like, you know what? I see you as beautiful. I want you to represent my clothing, wear my clothing down the runway. No one would care, unfortunately. 
But because it were these high names within, you know, Gautier and Galliano, both being super mm-hmm. high names within the fashion industry. And, you know, it was a Paris runway show. And, and you know, that kind of, you know, catapulted me to perceive, you know, being known within the industry because they took risks on me. And the reason they could take risks on me is based on the personal work that I did to like love and accept myself. Because you, you, you really are, if I got out on that runway and I suddenly freaked out or whatever, you know, that's going to screw up their vision of whatever they're trying to show. So I think that confidence really is key. And I think yes. that both of our confidence that we're speaking of, a lot of it is based on seeing yourself. And and when I was looking back in the day, NAFA Radiance Dimensions, like there weren't, there wasn't social media. Um, and so <laughs> that was what you had, you know? And I mm-hmm. think that that's part of why I create Voluptu. Um, because even previous to making Voluptu, I mean, there were very few magazines out there and they always seemed for the most part to concentrate on, you know, white, young, hourglass women for the most part. And they didn't have anybody supersized. And then, you know, people would ask me to model for their magazines, but they wouldn't put other people who were supersized in. They would never put apple shaped people in, you know, and, right. and within the mainstream fashion industry, you know, one time a year they'd put like, oh, this is our like African-American issue. And it's like, come on, you know? So, or like, look at us. We're like showing three size 14, you know, plus size women in our swimsuit page with 900 other pages that don't show that. So I felt like there was a definite need, not just to show like basically everybody who's forgotten by fashion. And that's why I don't just show you know, plus size people, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, that are forgotten by fashion. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I remember when I was working at Full Beauty and we did a homepage banner, the hero of the top of the the homepage was a size 16 model topless. And she was like wearing her breasts like this. And Uh everyone the company was losing their minds we can't put, put this up oh no my she's God. too big it's too risque uh-huh. and it's like no this is the evolution of fashion we have to show right larger bodies and it was a size 16 which now, I know 16 the like, average American on, woman is an 18 so it's right. like it sounds so ridiculous now when you think about it but it's even still happening today oh for I, sure I, I, and it's sad to say in the year 2023, we still have companies that are passing size 12 models. Yeah. Plus size model. And they have her wearing well. a 14 and pinning her in the back. Yeah. You know, and adding um, like boot pads and butt pads yes. and pad pads and patty pad pads. Yes. And the fat suits. Yes. Let's talk yeah. about the fat suits. Like it's totally. really ridiculous when I would think that they, you know, I don't know why they feel like she's not going to buy if we show bigger. Well, they used to say that the reason that they would not include people our size is because they had shown they had proven that if you put someone smaller, then it sells better. You know, perceptions of aspirational beauty is what they're referring to. But I always wanted to make a short film that I've not made, which I just think would be great which is to get, have like a couple of thin people go pick up. And this is back when, you know, there was actual catalogs, like a print catalog and be sitting at a cafe and be like looking through these catalogs with 900 pound people dressed in the clothing, trying to figure out what to wear. Cause that's essentially what we're given. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, I don't know, it was like Romans maybe catalog (laughs) even now, probably where you'd have these size 12 chicks selling to size 8X chicks. And you're like, how on God's green earth am I meant to know what this looks like? I mean, the the level of ludicrous that that, like, I don't think people can even conceive of it unless you do it in that manner where you show thin people looking at 900 pound people doing that, you know? Exactly. I mean, that's why it's refreshing to see like a company like Universal Standard. Oh, yeah. uses all different kinds of models. Now they use like older models. They use models that, you know, look different, don't are not the classic 
cookie cutter kind of model look. And sure. it's refreshing to see the diversity on their website. I just wish that other people, I mean, it's slow in coming, but then now with all the stuff going on with like, um, everyone's on a diet now. So it's kind of like gone two steps back. Mm, but I'm yeah. hoping that we can move up again, you know? Mm. Um, but it's people like you that I think are fighting the fight that I think Thank you're you. going to help in pushing that needle again. Um, we can't give up, you know, it's just, it's a fight that's well, going to be on. I think, think gonna... that so often fat people, if they're ever allowed within fashion, like nine times out of 10, because there really is no fashion, it'll be like naked with a hundred like bags on top of them or jewelry, which, you know, I kind of get just based on the fact that when I was modeling, if I, you know, stylists would have to actually style, they would have to actually work. They'd have to actually be crazily creative. I mean, I, I modeled for WAD magazine and they had me in sort of like a black kind of entire suit. And then they pinned all these clothes on me that were smaller size. And they, and I mean, it was just a way to show that like, yeah, I'm modeling, but it's just, there's nothing that actually would fit me within the samples that, you know, they wanted to show, but they got very creative with it. Um, wow. but I don't know that there's really any excuse for that, you know. That sounds amazing though. Yeah, I mean it was very fun, it was very creative for sure. But I, I I just feel like, you know, either it's shock value, which I would have some people come and say, Oh yeah, we want to model, but it was really just about like, you know, let's just show a hundred rolls of fat. And there was nothing really behind that other than this perception of like shock value, like, oh look, we're being inclusive. Or they're constantly hearkening back to the Renaissance. And it's like, you know what? The challenge is to show fat people actually in fashion, not like, you know, run-of-the-mill catalog, boring, you know, commercial shit, but fun, edgy editorial stuff. That's what, what yes. I'm about. So that's what Voluptu is about, is I was always, as an artist, really drawn to fashion editorials, which is like the three, four section of a, of a regular fashion magazine where you might see a girl in a gown, you know, standing in a junkyard, like all that kind of storytelling with fashion that's very rich, in my opinion. And that, to me, was always what interested me. And I didn't feel that there was enough of that that included fat people. And so that's really the drive behind Full Up To. It's really changing concepts in beauty, but also keeping like an edgy editorial fashion just with that. Yeah, and I think that it's wonderful that you have your magazine because I feel like plus size um, centric magazines are like a dying breed. Like, oh, for you sure. know, these, yeah. So, I mean, we still have plus I model mean, magazine, was, of course, was, and current yeah. fashion stuff, but there's, you know, it, there's not enough. So it's yeah. great that Volup 2 is there in the mix and you're different. It's like, it's set up because it's yeah. more. It's more art, but to me, it's another form of activism. Yeah, you know? for sure. It's another way of saying. I mean, it's definitely you know, more much radical, more radical yes, in any yes. fashion realm. Like, I really don't know <clears throat> within plus size or otherwise people who, you know, have a burn survivor as a cover girl. You know what I mean? And and I do that regularly, mm -hmm. be they amputees or, you know, differently able. The last cover actually a girl won the cover was um, a girl named Raven and she's my recent editorial and she has cerebral palsy. And I mean, again, how many people in the world have cerebral palsy and, you know, they wear clothes every damn day, but are they ever represented anywhere in fashion? Like they're absolutely not, let alone in kind of cool edgy stuff. So that was a really interesting and fun shoot. And um, I would encourage people to go check it out at beloved2.com. So yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement within the fashion industry in general in being inclusive, not just to plus sizes, but to super sizes and to people who, you know, different ethnicities, differently able, different ages, et cetera. Yeah. I feel like your magazine is like a love letter to the fat community. I've always felt that way. Um, and it's amazing. Everyone here should definitely check it out. Uh, Volu B O. L U P two.com um, and check out Velvet's magazine because it's yeah. amazing. Thank um, you. 
So who are some of your um, icons in the fat community? You know, I, I, I feel like my icons in the fat community are the fat community. There really isn't, like there are individuals who I could point out, but I think the true strength behind the fat community are the people that drive it. So to me, it's the general average fat person because the massive strength of our community is the fact we've created it. We have rejected being, you know, basically erased from society, be it in fashion or media or anywhere, particularly super fats, but fat people in general. And, and we have created our community. So it's like, we're not going to be ignored. We are, if you don't want to make clothes for me, then fine. We'll make our own clothes, right? Like, That's you know, right. you're not going to show us in any magazines, then you know what? Bloggers are created. We're going to show our own outfits. And, and to me, that's the massive strength of our community. It's really the people behind it are the fat people who, you know, oftentimes are rejected when we're younger and throughout life. And, and we've taken that rejection and we have created our own community. And so that to me is just an incredible value. And it speaks about the strength behind us in general. And, and, you know, also the stupidity of the capitalist society, <laughs> because the amount of money they could be making off of us is ridiculous. But you know yes. what, if you don't want to, we don't really care because we'll do it ourselves, you know, yes, not that I'm yes. making a mass amount of money, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you're that dumb, the, the plus size clothing sector is mm -hmm. now worth 31 billion dollars. No doubt. No doubt. And they're they're losing money. Yeah. As There's well, they money should to be made. It's like, and I'll give you an example. Um, right now I work for a brand, which I do not want to say, um, because I'm not particularly proud of working for them right now, but I hold hope that they're going to get better. Um, so recently one of the brands under the umbrella started offering plus sizes up to a 4X. Mm -hmm. They've already made in one month, they made almost four million dollars, but yet refused, they put plus all the way at the bottom of the homepage in one image. So of course. I got it's like where the plus right. size so, section is. It's like go up 10 flights and go yeah. in the corner. So they brought me to be in charge of that brand as well, just the plus, because they okay. call me the plus expert because I'm the only plus size person working there, right? Oh my and Lord. so when we have these calls about homepages, I'm over here saying, why can't we show a plus size model at the top and the hero alongside a straight size model. Right. You have styles that are available in both sizes and yeah. they don't know what to say to that. And it's like, it's not like she's not buying. She's buying. Right. The evidence is there. I mean, $4 million, like really? Like, come on. Right. So I think that it's, even though they say it's, oh, she doesn't shop. It's not that. It's how you oh, feel. Oh yeah, there's that, definitely you know? the perceptions of like, of the necessity to make high fashion exclusionary is what drives that attitude. The perceptions that if there is any fat body seen, it automatically, it's the same way that I was saying before, you know, you could have the exact two people in two different sizes doing the exact same pose. And there's always going to be one that is going to be perceived of not in that elite fashionista way. And the only reason for that is because of the multiplicity of images that we are fed. If yeah, if a hundred years ago, all there was was these exact same images, but with 900 pound women, then that would be the ideal, obviously, right? So right. it's really just this multiplicity of images that seduces society into the perception that this is high fashion. And that's why the risk taking of having me on the runway was great at that point, based on the fact that like, can you elevate a 300 pound body? And the interesting thing about that also was that I was 39. And so nobody spoke about ageism, which also is really right. predominant within the fashion industry, yes. which I found, you know, interesting. Yes, definitely. So I would love to ask you for anyone who is an aspiring model, like, what if a, a aspiring plus size model and even those that are outside of that size range, and mm -hmm. I say that in quotes, that um, that the agencies look for, which is right now, 1618 is now like that size, that hot size, right? So right. anyone that's 
above that? Like what advice would you give aspiring plus size models and how to break into the industry? Well, I mean, how I broke into the industry was possibly because I didn't really care about the industry. Like I was really more saying fuck you to the industry with the images I created. And that oddly worked because I wasn't following my images turned out to be so different than what the size 12, 14 people had, you know? And so it was very in your face and it was very editorial. Um, and, you know, I think that creating images that are memorable and that stand out are important. And I think, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of money. I think it feels like you have to have a lot of money, but I definitely like one of the most iconic images of me. Um, I saved up my money and paid a great artist named Maya Gez. And it was again, more of a statement because you know, it's me in a t-shirt that says, please feed the models. The models and at that yes. point, yeah, there were yes. people who were dying on the runway. So um, that was an investment. You know, it took me a long time to save up to work with Maya because she's a, a great photographer and she's created incredible images of me. And so I'd say invest in strong photography. Um, you know, if you can get clothes that are sort of out of the norm, which are more available now than they were in the past, and, you know, the way that photographers worked back in the day, you go in, you get the clothes, you shoot them and you can return them if you don't have a lot of money. Because I know right. that's like, for me, it was not, I didn't have a ton of money to deal with all that. You know, I saved up a lot of money. And then I took a friend of mine who's not a photographer to like a all-inclusive resort in Turks and Caicos. And I just, in exchange of taking him, had him shoot me. And I, mm -hmm. I found outfits that I created myself and I had a, a designer in, in New York who was a corset chair more than anything, Schumit Basu. I showed him what I wanted and then I had him made that, make them, right? So, I mean, I wanted thigh high boots, right? <laughs> like thigh high kind of white go-go boots. And of course they're not gonna fit my body. So then I okay. you know, had him cut them up and like put a zipper and add like an extension to them. So it, you know, I think if you're friends with drag queens, those are great people to hang out with because they do the same sort of yes. things. And it's a great community to just like see how much creativity you can get in the clothes you have and just try to stand out. But for me, it's like fun with fashion. It's like fashion should be fun. Fashion should be innovative. To me, fashion is less about following and a lot more about creating and, and being edgy and different and taking chances. So the thing that I, I see the most with women who want to be and men, um, you know, models is they'll have, you know, 978 selfies taken from here. <laughs> and, yes. and, you know, unless you are a massive star who's going to be in a perfume ad, they don't care that much about your face. Tragically, you know, I care about your face. <laughs> I care about everything, but you know, modeling is about your body for the most part, you know, cause you're trying to sell clothes. So I'd say as safe and as good as it might feel to have, you know, this shot a hundred times, you want to actually be showing yourself in fashion and you want to show your body, you know, I mean, have body conscious looks, you know, take risks and, uh, and just have fun with fashion. So I'd say really try to separate yourself from the images that are safe and and don't hesitate to reach out go to joanne fabrics pick out a pattern put up an announcement find some lovely grandmother who's going to help you make the clothing and and just stand out be a little different you know take risks and invest in good photography mm -hmm. and i want to add to that also as someone who gone to many events and have networked is to network with indie designers because a lot of them will be willing to make clothes for you. Sure. Um, they may not give it to you for free, but they may give you a discount in exchange for you taking pictures in their clothing, yeah. you know? And they may ask That's you, can true. you post on Instagram? Can you tag me? Um, and a lot of times they're so happy to create something for someone plus size because then it shows their range. It shows their, you know, versatility and that they are open to designing for anyone. So it's definitely pays yeah. to network. 
You never know who you're going to meet. Like you said, drag queens, you, you know, Definitely. you just never know. So you have and to be if you open need to like that. a team. There is, this is like a, an old sort of school thing to say, but I don't know if you guys know model mayhem, M O D E L M A Y H E M.com model mayhem. So you could go on there, you put up your images as a novice and then it, it like localizes your area. So I'm here in Rochester, let's say as a photographer, I want to do a photo shoot and I need a hair person. I need a makeup person. I need a model. I need a stylist. I can look locally on model mayhem for those things. And then, you know, you can do it for, for time for print so that it doesn't cost you anything because usually people are maybe starting out there. I mean, I ended up in, in, in like Vogue Italia through a photographer from Model Mayhem, Diego. Wow, um, I didn't Italy. know that. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so it's not like there's not good people on there, but there's yeah. also a lot of people on there who are not good <laughs> and who want to meet models and are purporting to be photographers. And it's really up to you to, to say like, okay, some guy says, oh yeah, I totally want to like shoot you. Like look at their work, you know? Don't fall for flattery just in order to, you know, be with some gross person who just doesn't have the talent to really shoot you. So you do have to be precautionary because there is some predatory people within that site and I don't want anyone yeah. to get hurt, but there's also some great creative people. And it's, it's a, it's a way that people who are starting out, who don't have the money to pay for a huge team can build a portfolio. Yes. And also I wanted to tell people who don't know time for print is you giving your time in exchange for images. So you don't pay the photographer, but you're giving him, you know, your him or her, your time. And I think mm -hmm. they can use your photos as well. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's mm -hmm. correct. Yes. So it's, it's basically an exchange of digital images at this point, back in the day, it was print print images. Right. You get like a couple prints, but now it's, you know, digital images and, equally, you know, good, but it, it's just a good way. Like, I just try to think back of when I started, you know, what I did and, you know, if people genuinely are looking to build a portfolio and they genuinely want to get into it, you know, you might be in the middle of Idaho, right? Like, right. and not everybody's in New York or Paris or London. So it's a good way to hook up with people within the community who have similar interests, you know, and who want to create magic. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're going to wrap this up with one last question. Mm -hmm. What does fat liberation mean to you? Mm, good question. Fat liberation makes me think of NAFA for one. <laughs> but fat liberation, I mean, it, it means to be the freedom of just living in your body. You know, that's, that's so, once you get to the place where you disconnect from the perceptions of other people's judgment, you're a hundred percent free. And that's the place that I'm in. And it's a great place to be. And, and it's based on, you know, the work of people who have been in NAFA and people like Marilyn Wan, et cetera, who, who really have um, paved the way for us. So fat liberation is like a hot donut on a Sunday morning. And I love it. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so we're going to make that into an image and we're going to post that on NAFA's social media <laughs> channel. <laughs> oh my goodness, I love it. So Julianne, do we have any questions? We sure do. Um, a question is, is plus size modeling threatened by AI? I think everything is threatened by AI if you perceive it as a threat. <laughs> because you know, it could conceive to be one. Um, I mean, it, it sort of is like, I've had people say you need to encompass it and embrace it and it's the future. And I've had people say that it is the end of the world. So, you know, I don't know that plus size modeling would be any more threatened than mainstream modeling. You know, if you perceive AI as a threat, then it's a threat. If you perceive it as a tool of creativity, then you can probably, you know, create images with 3000 pound people and, you know, have them dancing um, on top of the water with beautiful mermaids next to them. It all depends on how you see AI. Any other questions? I 
Julian? That's all that we have in the chat right now. Okay. Thank you for well, that question. Ahead. Yeah, tell everyone where they can follow you, your website, all that other good Well, you know, I'm actually going to be shooting. I'm in the Rochester, Buffalo area now, and I'm offering shoots here. So if anybody wants to invest in a shoot, I'm around up until October 5th. I think I go back to Paris. And people can find me. Well, my magazine is www.volup and then the number two.com. Um, and that's like Volup2 is also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest and all those things. How did Velvet feel about all the Karl Lagerfeld? Hmm. <laughs> I did get fat bullied. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my feelings on Karl Lagerfeld is that he took see, like a lot of deference to me modeling <laughs> because he was one of the, the people who, you know, just he basically after seeing me in both Galliano and Gautier, you know, made comments about no one wants to see a fat person modeling. And you know what? It's sad because Carl obviously was a former fatty and sometimes former fatties are their own worst enemies and they're yes. the most because they hated their own body back in the day and they have a perception of, you know, maybe self-righteousness or whatever, whatever they went through to get into a thinner body. They don't want people to, you know, be perceived of having their cake and eating it too, I guess, you know? So I, I mean, and there's a guy named Nako Paris who made a really great response to that, where he um, he made a T-shirt that said Carl Who with a question mark. And and <laughs> and I actually have a I did a shoot of Georgina Horn in that shoot, which I thought it was so fun. I, I got the T-shirt myself, obviously. Um, and he, being Carl Lagerfeld, saw that and actually adapted it and got the made got like a bag made or something that had it on there. So he kind of you know, just went with it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I just think it's sad to have somebody, anybody, be they fat, thin, or, or whatsoever, you know, have this attitude that people don't belong. Because you know what, right. we're all here. So we all do belong. Like that's like humanity belongs. So mm -hmm. the perception that you want to diss somebody who happens to be living in a bigger body is, you know, shame on you. That's the way I feel mm -hmm. it. So and in terms of um, me getting bullied in high school, because the Bill who asked the question to you went to Penfield High School, I was bullied so severely in grade school that I actually had to be taken out of school and I had to be put into um, like a private school for middle school. My, my parents kind of struggled to do that, but I just was so, you know, I, and I, and this is a funny ish story now looking back on it, but I was in, you know, fifth grade and I was, it was a gym class, which was my total torture and nightmare as for many people. And my gym teacher took the entire grade of fifth grade, not just my class, but there was like four classes and said, you know, Velvet Demore is not fat. She's big boned. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, kill me now. And, you know, I remember walking down the hallway and just getting kicked and kicked. And I was like, why are you guys kicking me? And this popular kid had like patted me on the back before that. And I was like, oh my God, like so-and-so patted me on the back, like feeling good, like a poor little fat child would. And then um, he had stuck the sticker on me that said, kick me hard. And so I just kept getting kicked. And, and that was the kind of typical, you know, torture of a fat youth <laughs> that I went through. But I will say, and, you know, try to find me wrong here, but the torture of fat people in their youth tends to create such incredible fun personalities. Like that's just like people have to not rely on lookism when you are a fat kid. So you develop like a personality, like how many fat people are hysterically funny, like a shit ton of them. Sorry, but it's true. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can't, lean into lookism so you're forced to create personality and like god bless us for that you know it's it i wouldn't choose to go through that but i think that that's sort of the end result of it it and i think with a lot of people what do you say to the people who say that fat have more important what was after that i sorry couldn't see it all 
I can read it for you. The question is, what do you say to the people who say that fat people have, quote, more important things to worry about than fashion, quote? Why is fat inclusion in fashion important for everyone, whether they care about fashion or not? Well, because fashion is fun. So why do we have to like even debate that question? You know, not that it's a wrong question for you to ask, but like how tragic that someone would say that, that like we should be excluded from the joy of fashion. Like fashion is so fun. You know, I mean, if you want to look at the, I mean, and as I said earlier, I don't see fashion as following. I'm not a person who, if Susie wears a red shirt, I'm going to wear a red shirt. I see fashion as just like having fun in your body, right? So I created actually during the COVID period, a section that I'm really excited about within Voluptu. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's the avant-garde fashion designer section where I highlight all these designers who are creating the most outrageous, the most fun, the least following, the just like they have the essence of what I perceive fashion to be, which is having fun with how you look. That's what it breaks down to. Have fun with how you look, you know? And, and it's so different. It's so, there's a person who, you know, they take a chair and they basically like tape it to their body and they put like layers of fabric over it. It's, it, you become art. And I think as an artist, like being excluded from fashion because we are, because we don't fit in the clothes that are out there means that you have to go and find somebody like Shumit Basu if you want to have different clothing that, that is not existing and create it. And, and then you get to be a piece of art. So that I think that adornment is so it's 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 literally so fun to live in whatever body you're in and decorate it decorate mm -hmm. it like a christmas tree if you want but the fact that we cannot decorate it meaning we cannot go and buy clothing because it doesn't exist for our sizes or it's very limiting and it's about hiding and it's not about celebrating means that fashion is important because if you want to make yourself a piece of art, if you want to enjoy the body you're in and, and adorning it in however you see fit, then that's in the end fashion, right? So for me, it's been very important because I, I really didn't rebel through like drugs or alcohol. I rebelled through fashion and, and I loved every second of it, <laughs> you know, and I think I continue to do that. So I think fashion's an important tool for rebellion within a fat body. I agree. That's that's how I um, live my life too. I wear like prints. I wear mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, color, because I'm sure. I just don't care. I'm like I'm going to wear what I want, and it's Absolutely. and that's like fat liberation, you know. Absolutely. So, that, that's exactly right. That's liberation. Someone else asked you a question, but I did, couldn't yeah. quite read it. I'm sorry. Julian, what was that question that someone asked? I think it was a comment um, okay. that fashion is political. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, I see a few other comments, but no specific questions. Fashion is definitely political. Um, but I love what you said, Velvet, about us all being a work of art. And I think that if more people embrace that kind of thought, it'll build that person's confidence. I think when we stop looking at fashion as something that is not in our favor, in a sense, like we're made to feel like we're not worthy. It and tries kind to of dictate that, trends for sure. Yeah. And flip that and say, wait a minute, I'm a work of art and I want to decorate myself. And yeah. that kind of opens the door to anything. And you're not a slave to just what's being offered in the stores. Totally. And then feeling like, oh, they don't carry my size, you know. Um, instead, you're like, I'm going to decorate myself. And I'm going to go true. to Joanne's, like you said, or Michael's and buy yeah. me some fabric. And I'm just going to have fun, you know. I know. I, 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 I mean, I have total envy of people who are pattern makers. Like, if I could download the brain of a pattern maker into my own brain, my whole life would be complete. Because those are the people that have the power to adapt all those patterns that leave us out mm -hmm. and, you know, make them, you can even adapt further after you've made the pattern. So that's like my fantasy. 
And I agree with what Rebecca said. Um, it is a really important, I know. Oh my God, you learned it. Rebecca Jones, we need, you need to be my best friend now. Yes, yes <laughs> Rebecca Jones, we're going to be hitting you up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I need to know you too. <laughs> right? I mean, I kept trying. I kept trying to take sewing classes in the perception that I would be able to make the clothes that I yearned for, but I could never get past threading the actual machine without wanting to throw it across the room. Because now I think they actually have self-threading machines. But back in the day, I was like, oh, my God, I give up. <laughs> oh, my God, good for you. Becca Plus, we're going to have to find you. Yeah, so, you um, so we're, almost, <laughs> we're almost out of time. I can talk okay. to you for hours. I know you, um, too. So, um, yeah, so you, you know, repeat where people can find you um, yeah. on yeah, you can find me um, at voluptu.com. You can find, if you want to write me personally, my email is V-O-L-U-P-T-W-O at yahoo.com. But the actual site is V-O-L-U-P and then just the number two.com. And, um, you know, I'm all in all the typical places, even though I'm shadow banned in all of them. Shape discrimination. Well, I mean, I think it's ridiculous. And I think that apple shapes are the people who are the least allowed to be seen. So I definitely am inclusive of them. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, I mean, part of the reason, I'm not a, an hourglass shape person, but I'm a pear shape person. And I think that that's probably the second accepted thing. Like you can be hourglass, yes. then you can be pear. Yes. Then a you pear. can be apple, you know? Yes. So yes. I, yes. I mean, shape, exi it obviously exists. Or the plus size models who they're forcing to put padding on wouldn't be putting padding on, would they, right? So- it exists. And I mean, I always had fun with my shape. You know, I, I love corsetry. I love like maximizing how big my hips would look by minimizing my waist. That was just fun for me. You know, and some people don't like corsetry. I have a good time with it. So, but it was less about making my waist small as much as it was about making my hips big. So, you know, how do you feel about fashion made for those who are in the alternative scene and being fat? Oh, I think that that's awesome. And I think that one of the few places within fashion that is more accepting is the fetish area. You know, I could find clothes within the fetish realm easier than I could find, you know, in the quote unquote fashion realm. So I think that, you know, the fetish realm has been much more accommodating to fat bodies than major fashion, you know, would be conceived of. And who knows if that's because we are often perceived as, you know, fetish objects. You know, we're objectified in that manner, especially if you're, you know, a super fat. So I say more power to the fetish community and just have fun with how, have fun with however you want to dress. I mean, I definitely was, you know, I would wear, I would draw veins all over my face and put veils over my head and <laughs> be very <laughs> um, kind of edgy in the glory days of my youth. So I say have fun with it. Fashion is meant to just be reveled in and it's become a tool to be used against fat people through the exclusion within the fashion, you know, industry. And we don't have to accept it just like we don't accept. That's right. So much. We can choose to make fashion fun and, and revel in it. And before we end, I just wanted to thank NAFA again and thank you and thank the interpreters and Julie, who, um, is it Juliana or Julie? Who's Julianne. The, Julianne. Julianne. I, I really appreciate all of you guys and everybody who tuned in to listen too. Oh, yes, thank you so absolutely. much, Rebecca Jones. Yes, it, it's been an honor. Like, thank you so much for blessing us with your presence thank and you. dropping some gems of knowledge. Oh my goodness. Um, oh, and you. just being inspiring. You know, it's we need more people like you in the community. We really do. And just know that you have definitely broken barriers for us. And oh, thanks. The community appreciates you. So thank you. Uh, and um, I also want to thank um, Pro Bono ASL, Flo and Ingrid. Thank you so much. Thanks, and Flo and Ingrid. Just want to say, you know, we were able to offer these webinars free of charge to the fat community um, and fat supporters of all sizes. And we were able to do that through the generous support of people like you. So to support more progr programming like this, and to support all the other work that we do to make the world a better place for fat people, please visit nafa.org 
forward slash give to make a donation today. Any amount we would appreciate. Um, again, thanks to Velvet. Thanks to Pro Bono ASL. Thanks to everyone who attended. And that's it. It's a wrap. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody.